the API. Um, so there was a question, who used the API? Um, who used um, the API with curl or anything like that, that on, a, on a CLI? Who used some kind of client, like a Python client or Go client? Okay, so um, I will only use bash and curl today. Um, everything which is done here can be done it should be done in Go or in any other language which is, which is more suited than, than, than Bash, of course. But I will just use curl because uh, it just does what we need here. Um, I want to talk about the API and, of course, the API server. And I guess most of you will know this picture, more or less. Um, the API server is a central component. And it has some storage, the etcd um, cluster here. And there are many components uh, around that, the controller manager, the scheduler, or the kubelets, and the kube control, and somewhere else, maybe you with your own client, uh, your own controller, or whatever. And everybody talks to the API server, and we want to, talk, we want to, to, to see um, yeah, what is the API, not what every object, so I don't talk about um, fields in the pot, it's not the topic. I try to be much higher, much more abstract, um, the principles, I call it, um, of the API. So we won't see any pods today. So um, it's not about launching pods. Um, this is, of course, the main purpose of Kubernetes. Um, but everybody who uses Kubernetes has seen that already. So it's pretty boring. But I want to talk about the um, things behind um, the concepts. So um, yeah, an API-centered um, view here. So we have a lot of um, endpoints, HTTP endpoints here, REST API. And also the, the, many, um, the many components. And what is really important already, um, you see this, the scheduler, the order manager, all the internal components, they use the same API as you do when you write something against the API. And also if you use, no, that's too much. If you use kube control, which is a normal way to, to operate a cluster, it's also just speaking to those. Um, Endpoints, and on the left there is a big um, cloud here. It's the API server process. Um, yeah, one can take a look and all the, the paths, all the, the endpoints which uh, exist. So there are uh, a number of global ones. You can read the metrics. You can ask the server for the health. And then you have the, the core group. Everybody knows that who has seen the API probably. So here are the pods, for example, of the services the nodes, also the normal objects you use, and then you have, um, for, for a few versions, you have some API groups here. Um, you have the batch group, which has cron drops and uh, similar things. You have a big extension group, and a number of them, um, which are not listed here, like stateful sets and airbug and the network policies, which we saw. Everything is somewhere here in this API group, while this, this, this branch of the API and here are the API groups. But as I said, it's not really the, um, yeah, the context today to, to show all the details. Um, we want to see um, something yeah, much more abstract. So um, to give you a picture, if you haven't used the API directly, so we, we launch an API server here. Um, first, we need an etcd. Pretty simple without any arguments. So we don't have um, certificates involved. So it's really, really simple what we do here. And um, in the second, uh, View here, we start the API server. And um, it's not that complicated if you. Why is it so dark? I don't know. Can you... It's white here on my screen, but it's, it's not really. It wasn't like that uh, 10 minutes ago. Yeah, yeah, 30 seconds. Oh, no. No, that's not good. Good. One sec. It'll be back there. I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I changed the source. There you go. Yeah, much better. So that's a command line, the minimal command line, as I found it's out. Just gone again. To, to launch it again. Can you read it? Maybe we just stay with that. Can you read it? No. So it's. <laughs> no, I can make it bigger. Is it flux? Did you do it again? It happened again. I have no idea. It's only in the dark with this. It's what? It's only dark with this. It's, just, it's only like this with this terminal. If I move backwards, why? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. 
It's some main feature. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, the minimal command line to launch uh, a Cube API server uh, nowadays. So I disable everything which is secure, so no secure port. Um, LCD uh, without certificates, we have to give it an IP range. All details does not really matter. Um, we want to see later uh, what is really stored in etcd and that's much easier if we use etcd uh, version 2. So we don't use the 3 version which is default nowadays. And we also use um, JSON as a storage format, not protocol because you, can, uh, you cannot read that. Um, so this is not really a production setup here of course, um, but uh, for demonstration purposes it's okay. So let's launch that. Um, it's a, um, so everything I show here is uh, the code master from this afternoon, so there are some uh, uh, lock entries here which are not so nice, but we don't care, so I, I make it small anyway. So the top one is the Cube API server, and then the lower one is the NCD. And um, the NCD we can also uh, query. So that's how the tree looks like, so that's what the API server stores there. Um, and you find certain things like namespaces. Everybody knows namespaces, and there's a default namespace usually. It's already here, and we can also query it. And you will see um, this really looks familiar. We have the command line here, otherwise I can, yeah, here it is. So everybody who has written an object um, for Kubernetes uh, recognizes it as here. It's a JSON format um, of a namespace. And um, yeah, there are things I will, I will mention in a second. Um, yeah, so I, I can copy here, let me see. So I can also use cube control, get pods, you would, I can do that, um, not if I forgot to set the context correctly. So you get the pod, if we do namespaces, we get the namespaces, same we just saw in etcd, and um, I can also say minus o JSON, and then we see exactly the same which we just saw in etcd. It's not really exactly the same if you go into the details because the API server um, adds stuff here which is not stored uh, in etcd, but it's just a detail. And um, what is really helpful um, to investigate the API just increase the verbosity level of cube control because then you really see what happens below the surface. So if you do, I think minus seven is the smallest one, then you see the, um, yeah, the URL which is used for namespaces and we can also um, query that of course directly. Um, everything I do here is not um, secured as I said, so can easily be done. If you do it on a production cluster, you usually um, use Cube Control Proxy to get an um, in insecured version locally on the local host, um, but here it's very really simple. So many ways to, to access the API server. Um, yeah, we can also write, of course, it's not only readable, so we can um, annotate, where's my command here? So I annotate the namespace. Um, default, so I give it an uh, annotation meetup equal to hello. And if we do that, and we look into the etcd again, we should find that. Here it is, so as expected. And there's one feature, um, uh, where is it? So, I do it again using tube control. And you might have seen um, there's always a version count. Where is it? A resource version 12. Just remember that. That's in every object. And um, to give you an idea what it is, if you look at the etcd, it's just this number here. Every, every um, object, um, if you write it, if you modify it, this number increases. And this is important for concurrency and for consistency, I'll show in a second. Um, yeah, do I have forgotten anything? No, I think we have everything. Yeah, as I said, resource version is important. We have the annotations and um, we have something a kind. What is, uh, I'll explain it in a second what a kind is. Um, and certain things in those objects here, they're always the same. And um, every, I mean, if you have a, a namespace, 
you have namespace here, if it's a pot, you write pot here, of course. And the metadata is the same for all objects. So it doesn't matter if you have a pot, a service, whatever, your own object, uh, as we see later, um, you always have the same fields here. And just the lower part, the spec and the status, that depends really on, on the type. Um, yeah, what about the version? So, um, we already wrote something, we wrote an annotation to an object. And what happens um, if there are two processes writing? So, for example, the kubelet modifies pod objects, it writes a status into them. At the same time, you have your kube control and you edit the pod as well. What happens when um, some, um, some conflict arises there? And I want to demonstrate that, what happens. Um, so, what we have just done um, with kube control, no, it's not the way on, one second. I have to copy it. Um, what you just did with kube control and manually, we can of course also script. I, I told you already, I use bash here. So um, I query the default namespace again. I use jq, it's a cool tool to modify JSON. So um, a nice line here which just writes an annotation. And to see uh, that it changes, if we uh, run that more, more than once, I, I don't write meetup hello here, I just put a random value, so a random number. And um, after changing this object, I write it back. So if I run that, you will see the meetup annotation has some random value, and if I run it again, it gets a different value, and so on and so on. So, and we can do that multiple times. So I run that in a while loop. So I modify the object as fast as possible. So it's a hot loop, so there's really no sleep in between. And you see how fast the system is now here on the local host. Um, I have to go down twice a second, something like that. I can modify the object. And in the second terminal here, I do the same. Um, to see a difference, I write A random, and in the other one, I write B random. So I run them. And um, I'll stop it again, just to show what it does. Um, if there's a conflict, the right HTTP call here, um, the put um, yeah, gives an error and I break the loop. So as soon as a write doesn't succeed, this loop will, quit, will break. And if we are lucky, in a few seconds, we will get a conflict. If we are lucky. Uh, Shouldn't rely on luck. I have a slide which, which shows that. I mean, if this, uh, this happens here, um, the thing, the HTTP will print out the conflict. So it's a 409, not a 200. Um, it's a conflict. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a um, type for that. And you see a message here, um, I cannot write because the object has been modified. So the other process was faster. It was reading. I was reading. The other one was writing. I tried to write again. And there was a conflict. And um, this is called optimistic concurrency because when you read, you wait, you do something, process, and you write, um, you don't want to overwrite it. And this is done by, um, by using those versions. Um, where is it? Here. No. I read an object, I get the 73. I modify it. I write the annotation, for example, what we did in the example. I write it back with resource version 73. And if there's a new version already, etcd will know that because in etcd there will be the 74 or 75. And the, the, right, the right handler in the API server sees that and rejects my write of the 73. Optimistic concurrency. And it's, a, it's the base pattern um, of every controller. If you, if you modify objects in Kubernetes, you will always hit that. And what is very important, you must be prepared that conflicts arise. It's not an error, I mean, it's an error technically, but it's completely normal. Just try it again, read the new object, modify it again, try it. Do that 15 times, and the chances are very low that um, you get a, a conflict in each of those. Um, yeah, we have seen some, some URLs already. I want to say a bit, yeah, more, a bit more details about it. Um, so, 
we have the API um, prefix here usually. So I go back to the slides, the big one here. Um, we have one branch in the API server uh, URL uh, universe. It's called API, and then there is a version v v1, and then there are all the normal, the normal old objects, the classic objects. That's called um, core. It's a core group, and it's a bit special because nobody thought about API groups um, a year ago or one day, a half year ago. That's why this one is special, and it's it's not below APIs. It's still here, its own branch. It will go away probably at some point. But at the moment, we have that. Everything else is below APIs. And if we look at such a uh, URL, this word here, the second component, is called the API group. So batch is about batch jobs, of course. Um, there's apps, which has stateful sets at the moment. There's Airbag for, for security stuff. Network for network policies, I guess it's called. Um, and um, we have a version, of course. We want this. I mean, most uh, normal, normal resources, they are in V1 of the core group. Um, some, um, yeah, some types are not in, in production-ready state yet, so they are called alpha. This one is V2 alpha, so it's something after V1. It's the alpha version of the next iteration of batch jobs. And after the version, um, the, resource, uh, the resource is uh, put, so in this case it's jobs can be con jobs in these API groups. Um, and those three things here make up um, yeah, a fully qualified um, name of a resource. So a pot is in the core group, it's V1, and it's a pot. So by that, I know the schema um, for, for the JSON I have to use. Um, I put something above here. Um, jobs are namespaced. So you can have the namespace default, cube system, or your own meetup, for example. And um, for many resources like the jobs, there is a namespace in between. So you have to write v v2 alpha1 namespace default jobs, and then the name of the job. Um, there are other resources called cluster-wide resources which don't have that. I mean, we saw it already for namespaces themselves. They don't, uh, of course, they are not namespaced because um, yeah, they don't talk about their own concept. Namespaces don't have that. And for, for uh, gravity, I, I omit that in some slides. So for many resources, you need this namespace um, pairs component as a segment. And um, when you post something, um, so you have uh, on the command line here, maybe we see the conflict meanwhile. Oh, we got it. So here, I promised it. There it is. Um, we are posting, um, in this case, to the namespace default, and um, by the version, of course, it's clear which kind of object you have to post. So it's always some, uh, some JSON, it's never YAML, it's always JSON, or protobuf, um, and you have to put the right version. If you post the V1 onto this resource here, on this job, it will just be rejected, it's invalid. Um, but of course, you can have multiple Pads, like you have an API's batch v1 jobs as well, and then you can post in one of those. Um, there's often confusion about yeah, those words. There's, I, I called them types before, or objects. Um, the technical terms are resource and kind. Um, they are mostly the same. Um, technically, the resource is a, the HTTP path, so this word is a resource. And the kind is what you see inside of the JSON. And um, they mostly match. Um, you might have seen um, a status object. If there's an error of a, of a call, you get a status back. And then you have the kind status for the job resource. So the, in some corner cases, they don't match. But most of the times, they do. Versions. Um, I said already jobs exist in V1. They exist in V2 alpha, and there, there was a V1 alpha before the V1. And what is very important here for, for the type system of, of uh, Kubernetes, they all share one namespace, which means if you, if you create a job, you can um, retrieve that in all versions, as you like. You can, you can ask for the V1 version, you use the, the, the URL for the V1 for your job, and you get the V1 object back. You can also use the V2 alpha one, 
So I mean, if you have a client nowadays, you probably use V1 because that's a stable version. But maybe next year there is a V2 version, and your client doesn't know that yet. So you can have cube control which speaks V2 already because it might be one one nine or something like that. Um, so a new Kubernetes, and you, you use the V2 version, and now your old client comes, he sees the same object, but he he calls uh, the URL for the V1. And um, he gets the same object, it has annotations, so the, um, this, this whole thing is lossless here, so they all carry the same information, but of course the schema is different, so the JSON schema. So everything which cannot be stored in the old version must be put in annotations, for example. But you can, um, I mean, if you create an object, it appears in all those three versions in this example. Lossless conversion. Um, yeah. We have a nightly con job here as an example. Um, the name is nightly, and this exists in all three um, URLs. So we saw the namespace already in, in etcd. So that was one example on the command line. So we, we can, no, not this one. We can stop this one here, and here we see the namespace again. And it's stored in V1 because namespace is so old, existed since, I don't know, two years or so. Um, it's in V1, it's stored in V1. Of course, you can only choose one version to store. And um, this is called the storage version. So every object is stored in a certain version in your etcd. In, by default, it's put above nowadays, I think, since 1.5 or so. Or 1.6 now. In storage, was it 1.5? And on the wire in, I, I don't know. Anyway, nowadays it's, it's put above um, by default. Um, but it can be JSON as well, so if you have old objects in your etcd, they might still be JSON, and next time they are written, they are converted to put above. And you have many conversions here, so when, when something is read from etcd, you get maybe an old JSON version, then it's converted to the storage version, and then you ask for that object in V1, so it's converted again, maybe, depending on which version you have here. So it might be that you have three, three conversions until you really have the object which you get back from the API. So conversion is an important topic. Um, yeah, there are many kinds. Um, who of you has used TPRs, third-party resources? That's a feature which um, I think it's I'm not sure when it was introduced, but maybe 1.3 or something like that, or 1.2, so it's pretty old already. And people started to use that. Um, but I will show, um, yeah, it's not that, that stable yet, so it's still an alpha version. Before we do that, um, if, if we want your, our own kinds, um, our goal is that Cube Control, for example, knows your kinds. So if I created my own kind, for example, I want to um, offer database as a service. I have a kind which is called database. We will do that in a second. And um, Cube Control should be able to create databases, JSON objects in the API server for databases with specification and status and so on. Um, it has to know about that, of course, um, that there are databases in the API server. And to do that, um, there is a concept called yeah, discovery. And um, yeah, I don't have to show that. You can just uh, do that in command line yourself. Um, you can ask the APIs slash um, path here, and the API server will tell you in a big JSON list which groups exist in which versions, which is the preferred version, uh, and so on. So yeah, maybe I do it just to, to have an idea uh, how big that is. So Here it is, that's a, it's a root uh, URL. We get all the, the sub URLs here, the sub paths, but we want APIs. And here it is. So many, many API groups and versions already. And we can dive into one, so we can say, I want batch v1. I hope this is enabled, we will see. It is. And in batch one, uh, batch v1 we have at the moment the jobs, yeah, just the jobs. I think con job might be better or alpha or something like that, so it doesn't show up here. Um, 
And this is used by kube control. So every time you, you, you get, as you say, kube control get database, for example, it will ask the server, which API groups do you know? Is there one resource which is called database? And if there is, it can be shown and listed on the screen. Um, I talked about cluster-wide resources before. So they have this, um, yeah, this uh, infix here, namespace name, and here you have namespace two, and this of course corresponds. So if the resource is namespace, you have to put this into the, the pairs of the URL. And um, as before, as I, saw, uh, I showed on one slide, so here is a resource, that was uh, the URL part, um, that's a name here in the discovery, and the job is a kind, and here in this case it correspond, and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's normally um, that the kind is, is uh, uh, with a capital uh, letter, and the, the uh, resource is with a lowercase letter, the resource is usually plural, that's just convention. Um, it is like it is. We will see it's not so easy to, if you have your own resource, you have to know what is the plural. It's not that trivial, um, leading to, to, to issues in the TPRs. We'll see in a second. Um, yeah. So, discovery. Now we can start with third party, third party resources, short TPRs. They are alpha. That's a big warning sign. They are in the API group extensions in the v1 beta one, I think. They are in the beta uh, version because alpha didn't exist when they were introduced. But they were, I mean, the, the requirements for, for um, promotion to beta were never fulfilled, so it's really, really early here. And we will see it in a second that, yeah, they, they feel like alpha. Um, TPRs can be created, so it's in extensions, as I said, in v1 beta 1. It, um, the description of a TPR is a type or a kind itself, it's called third party resource, and you can give it a name, that's a group, the API group, database, example, com. It's like batch in the example we had before. Here we call it database example com. Description is just um, cosmetic, and you give it a version. And if we do that, mm, so we create this, um, this guy here, databases TPR. It's created. Cube control get not databases. I don't even know how to get some third party resource. What's it the type? Yeah, here it is. There it is. Um, I have two versions here, um, different as in the slide. Um, I tried to, to get them working. Um, I didn't succeed with that, so it's, it's buggy, it's alpha, as I said. Um, we can create an object now of this, um, oh, maybe I show before, discovery. So databases example.com, and if we didn't do any mistake, uh, it's not there. Uh, maybe it takes some time, can also be. Um, I said alpha, there's a reason. Um, maybe for, before I continue, um, there's a really large list of projects already which use those TPRs. And there's a high pressure that TPRs are made much more stable than they are at the moment. Um, I, I show in a second uh, the direction of this uh, endeavor, for maybe for 1.7. Um, but what we have here, it's, uh, it's still the alpha uh, TPR. So, can you switch it up again? It went dark. It went dark. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so we create an object. Um, we want a database for a WordPress installation. It's just it's a fake um, object here. We don't we create a database, but um, just for, for presentation purposes. Um, yeah, I think I have two of them because so. That's how the actual object looks like. So here we created the API group and the version called database example com slash v1. And now we create an object inside of this new third party resource API group. So we have to use the same um, API group. And now I know why the, the discovery didn't work. The database is, of course, as a resource name. So the object which you create, they live in example com v1. And this guy here, 
That's a resource which is translated with some heuristic into kind, probably by just uppercasing the D. And it has a name, WordPress, and what is written in this object, so the spec in this case, that's just free form JSON. You can put whatever you want. Just put a JSON block, or YAML in this case, and it's stored in this object. There's no validation, there's no rejection, there's no admission, nothing. Just a block stored, that's it. Um, there is metadata, so we have a resource version. So we saw this conflict, those two loops which were conflicting at some point. This works with CBRs. But everything which is below here, all the nice things which um, yeah, you are used from pods, for example, pod specs, it just doesn't, doesn't exist, just a block. And what I want to show, um, because it didn't work on the cube control, um, yeah, uh, I said kinds are usually singular, they're not plural. But if this is mapped to the kind by uppercasing, um, yeah, you can only make it singular or plural, you have to decide at the moment, you can do both, it's never consistent. Um, anyway, so just accept that. It's even worse. Um, if you curl those, those guys here, you get, if you have plural, you get database SS. So maybe it's better to, to have a kind which is singular and then you avoid that. Um, I don't know. Anyway, so um, everything you saw already um, for, for, for jobs, all the APIs here, um, the, the curl examples, everything here you can do with PPR as well. So it's a really, it feels mostly like a real object with some consistency issues, um, but this will go away when this, this, this DPR, uh, yeah, this uh, concept leaves alpha, maybe at some point in the next months. So, um, here's one example now for the TPRs, which I didn't show yet for, for jobs. There's a nice feature, it's called a watch. And if you use cube control, there's a minus W um, option, um, or minus minus uh, watch. And if you use that, um, you do not get the databases as usual, but you get an, an infinite stream. So it will tell you there's a new object. Um, behind the, the, the output here of cube control, of course, there's JSON again, which you, uh, you see here. So you get an event object. Uh, nightly is deleted, object blah is added, and those are really in real time, very fast, and you can, pro can process them. And you don't um, pull on the server, but you get, get real events. And that's how um, yeah, every controller in Kubernetes is implemented. So never hot loop like we did with our nice while loop before. Use those watches and they also use, uh, they, they work with TPRs as well. Um, if you look behind the curtain, um, this minus minus watch here, um, it's just uh, a parameter to the URL, so it's watch equal to two. And you can say, I know everything up to version 434. I don't want events from before, just from this version on. And then the next update will be yeah, from this version on. Um, you can also say zero here, then you get all the events, in brackets, all the events which are still in the cache. So you're not guaranteed to have everything from the last two weeks, but um, I know 1,000 or something like that, uh, events you get for every object, something in this direction. Um, so usually you start with a zero, and um, when you, I mean, this, this curl here, of course, it can terminate because you have network issues or whatever, your process is restarted. Um, and you have to restart it, then you know already the version, the last one you have seen, and then you can pass it here and avoid all events. Um, yeah, I will not show it here because uh, in my master branch this didn't work anymore for, for some reason. In 161 I think it works, but this one works, this is real data from, from the master branch. <coughs> Alpha. Um, there is a famous issue, 95, and it has something like 15 uh, outstanding capabilities and bugs and inconsistencies um, and a huge discussion below. Um, Luckily for a few months, not a few months, one month maybe, we have a proposal for a beta version of PPRs. It's actually, a, well, it will be a re-implementation um, with a hard cut, so you have to export the data properly and re-import your PPRs. Um, but then it will be consistent. So those singular plural things which we saw before, they will be solved finally. 
And um, there are other inconsistencies. Um, this one is much, much better and will be a good basis for the future. Um, as I said, they are limited and they will be limited even in the beta version. So we had seen those three job uh, versions with the lossless conversion in between. This doesn't exist. TPRs don't have conversion because how should it work? The API server has just a block. He cannot convert anything. He hasn't, or he doesn't have the knowledge for that. Um, no version conversion. There is no defaulting. When you create a pod nowadays and you forget to put, I know, there are many fields which have default values. You don't, you don't have to pass them. But if you create an object and you get it back, then it's defaulted, it's a, it's a term. So you have um, fields which have, uh, which have default values. This doesn't exist for the same reasons. Validation, the spec which we saw is just free form. This might be added at some point. It's not, I mean, technically it's possible to have a grammar for JSON and then this could be added to a TPR and validated. I guess this will happen uh, yeah, in the next months. Sub resources, um, yeah, many people complain that you don't have a status field uh, which you can update. You always have to, to, um, to, to push the whole object um, to the API server. Um, yeah. Admission, so everybody might have seen some, some pod which is, uh, which is rejected. For, for example, you don't have permissions to, um, yeah, to have a privileged pod. Then you, it's rejected when you create it. Um, there are, I know, 15 admission um, checks in Kubernetes nowadays. Um, it doesn't exist for similar reasons as before. And it's alpha, so be prepared that this beta proposal will be implemented uh, maybe in 1.7 or 1.8. Um, it might slightly change, but the, the, the core concept will be similar. Or maybe even the, the, the type or the, the, the kind names are the same, we will see. Demand is high. Um, so there will be improvements, there will be beta, and maybe certain or a subset of those might be implemented. Um, uh, Brandon Phillips and Co. Has, um, he has a big interest because the etcd operator uses uh, TPRs and this is of course a critical uh, part of the infrastructure. So he made a list of, of users of TPRs and it's huge, it's really long. And um, just take a look, I post the slides uh, later on. So um, TPRs are limited. What is or what happens when you want something which is more powerful than, P than TPRs? And there's something new, it's called API aggregation. Um, it's alpha in 1.6, so you can try it. There's a, a binary called cube aggregator. And in the current master and in 1.7, of course, um, it's part of the API server I will show in a second. The goal, of course, is um, yeah, to, to have all that here. Everything you, you see here, you can have for um, yeah, if you if you implement um, kinds with a um, with an external API server called aggregation, and you have to do it in Go. I, actually, you don't have to do it in Go, but um, the libraries are for Go at the moment. Technically, one could do it in Python or in Java, whatever you like. So the goal is um, to have your own kinds, but with all the features here, unlimited, like really native kinds in Kubernetes, but without modifying the binaries of Kubernetes. Um, as I said, alpha in 1.6, in 1.7, um, there might be, it's still alpha, but um, it will be integrated with the API server. And, um, you know, a couple hundred lines of code. Um, it runs, uh, so you can implement this in Go in your own process, so it's really next to the API server. Uh, you don't have to do authentication and authorization, you can just delegate that to the API server. Um, it has all the information, just a webhook. And everything um, you store, it's stored at CD. And there's a repository for that um, called K8SIO uh, API server. Um, how does it look like from the architecture? So this picture you have seen already, there's the API server and the cube control talks to the API server and that does stuff and stores it in at CD, the, the objects. Um, and the idea of the aggregator looks like that. Um, it aggregates APIs, so you have your old API server here, and then you have third-party API server. So service catalog is an example which will, uh, it's, it's developed at the moment to, to share um, services uh, between 
clusters between namespaces so you can export databases, for example, to another namespace. It's a big project. And there are a number of pass implementations like OpenShift from, from, from Red Hat or Days or something like that. All of them can be implemented in theory using this concept. So you have one process for, for OpenShift, for example, in the future, not now. You have the API server, and the aggregator is above, and it aggregates. And you can imagine every one of those has discovery. So we saw the discovery before. And um, this one asks the API server, which resources do you have? Oh, those 27. Um, which API groups does the service catalog have? Those two, and the pass has another three, and then you have a big list which the aggregator knows about. And it's a proxy, so it just um, passes each API group to one of those API servers. It's always API group, um, the kind of reality. Can yeah. it also do access control? Yes. Everything. Can you repeat the one? Um, can it do access control? So you delegate authorization authentication to the API server. So the service catalog um, can ask the API server with a simple webhook, is this allowed for user X, Y? And then, so it's really, it's, I mean, there's really no distinction between those. It's the same technology. The library we saw before, it's already used in the API server. So it's the same thing. Um, don't be confused. It's not what I paint in green here. It's called cluster federation. Federation has been in Kubernetes for two versions or so. I don't know. Um, it's a different thing. It looks similar from the architecture here. This is more about um, you, have a, you have a service in your federation server, and you have um, availability zones in Europe, in US, in Asia, and um, the, the federation server, it spawns pods in all of those three zones. That's a different thing. It's not about API groups. In this example, all those servers have the same API groups. And just the so objects are activated. It's a different thing than here. Here are really API groups, so the, the types, some are on, on API server, some are on service catalog, and some are uh, part of the pass. That's a different thing. Um, so discovery, I said already, Discovery comes in, people will ask which resources exist, and it forwards them to those three. And the same for GET. Um, if I have a service catalog and I ask for a subscription for a WordPress database, um, he knows service catalog belongs to this API server, and it just pass on and um, answered. And as I said, authentication um, is done um, between them, and of course, um, the vision behind that is at some point in time you have a Kubernetes um, cluster and you want service catalog, you just say uh, Helm or whatever we have in a year, Helm install service catalog and then this API server is part of the cluster and you have resources with the queue control. Just seamlessly, you can just use queue control, create service announcement and use those features of service catalog. Um, 1.6, as I said, alpha. In 1.7 it will change much simpler, so all or the aggregator and the API server are one process, um, much easier to deploy, but otherwise the same applies uh, as before, so you can have those distinct API servers next to it. But everybody will have aggregation, that's the point. You don't have to deploy another pod or anything like that. Um, if you want to, to, to see how this works, there's a Sample uh, API server, a couple of hundred lines of Go code, um, Kubernetes sample API server, um, and this uses the API server library to implement the thing. And if we are lucky, we can just launch that. Um, there's a demo bot with me, so I kill my my etcd, my queue control, and I launch a cluster here. Local, oops. So this nice local app cluster SH script, um, very hacky, but it gives us here very simple, um, no, very simple Kubernetes. I don't want to compile, I just want to run it. Once my password, there it is, creates certificates, so everything is secure now. It's a very simple, it's like Minikube, but more for developers. Um, don't remember that, use Minikube usually. But here um, we use that, um, we have to, change our cluster URL, and if we are lucky, we have a Kubernetes, we have, and we start our sample 
API server, which we saw already, um, the repository at least. And yeah, you have to pass it a few um, commands here. Um, we don't want authentication um, because it's too complicated to set up here. Authorization is disabled, or it uses uh, the cube config from, from my cube control. It uses the same etcd server, so you can have a separate one if you want. You can use etcd operator, but it doesn't have to be um, like that. And the secure port is launched. And to enable that now, we have to register it. So there's a kind API service in this API registration. That's an API group specially for aggregation. And we say we want to register an API. It's called v1 alpha1 Vartal. Uh, we have to ask the native, spe native speaker. It's a fish or something like that? No idea. I think it's a fish. Um, because the resource which is uh, offered by the server is called Flander. Flander. That's a fish, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe. Anyway, so um, that's an example. Um, this is the API group version v1 alpha1. Um, it has a spec. Um, just replicates what is here as priority, so you can have two um, uh, API servers which have the same API group, but only one can be uh, exposed, of course, so the priority comes into play. And you have to uh, give a service um, for the API server. Usually, you deploy a pod with the API server, so it uses the service for the pod. Um, and then you have to define the service, of course. And this name of the service here in the spec um, yeah, it must point to the right service. Obviously. And port 8443, I hope that's the right one which we used here. Yeah, it is. So let's create our service. This is just standard. And let's create our API service. Keep uh, control get API service. Do we get that? Yep, we get it. So those are the known API um, services, um, all the standard ones, which are auto-registered. So they just, just appear because the API server knows them already, they're internal. And somewhere should be our model. Here it is. So we, we have our no, new API group. And um, so the server knows about it, and he knows about the service. And um, you can use, uh, that's my command. I cannot copy it now. Um, so, as expected, we have localhost APIs on our new API group, the version, and then there's a resource called Flanders below. Um, I tried with kube control, at least in the master version, it doesn't work at the moment, that's why I don't, I don't present it. Um, it's really prototype at the moment, alpha. Uh, the aggregated version alpha in, or the combined version with the API server, API server alpha in 1.7 probably. Um, and then you can just say cube control get flanders and you get your flanders and you can create them and so on. Um, and you have admission and uh, validation, all those things, the nice things you want uh, for those objects. They look like APIs but are much more powerful. Um, that's what we have seen already. Um, who wants to know details about that? There is a big post. Um, yeah, that one, I think, where those two approaches are compared. Um, it's really about the architecture and uh, which direction it should go. Um, yeah, and as I said, here is a lower link. It's the one from, from Brandon Phillips over TPRs. So there are really like 30, yeah, not non trivial projects from from open source uh, communities, but also from companies which use TPRs. And so it's an important thing, and we will see a lot of progress probably in the next months. Um, as I said, I use Bash here for, for presentation, don't use Bash in production. Um, there are many libraries here. There's a Go library which comes from, it's extracted from the Kubernetes uh, repository, it's called Client Go. There is another one from CoreOS, which is much simpler and smaller. Um, it's also very good. Um, and there are many more. There's a Python library, which is official, I think. Maybe is it GA who knows that. I don't know what the status is, but it was published and it's part of the Kubernetes uh, project now. And there are many more um, here. So pick the favorite one and use that. It's much better than Bash, of course. 
Um, yeah, that's it. So we extracted Very this. Question. Yeah. Um, so it was, the question was: uh, Are there many projects which use those external API servers already? Um, so we extracted the API server library in 1.6. So in January, something like that. It was finished more or less. And the service catalog project, which is a project by Red Hat, by Days, and Cloud Foundry, I think. So it's really multi-company uh, effort, and they used it immediately faster than we could uh, make it stable. So they use it and they, they are really the first and making that usable. And um, they, So we, we heard a lot of interest at least in this direction. Google has something internally we, we heard and um, yeah. Um, it's, it's really, it's new. So it's, it's, it's always, the library is yeah, 1.6, shortly before 1.6 was more or less created in, in, in GitHub. So um, just a few weeks old. So I don't know the list. I can can open the TPR list maybe now. Yeah, no, that's a client list. This one. So, yeah, I was stressing the point that it's alpha today. Um, it is, and be prepared for changes. But it's pretty cool, and um, yeah, you see many things are implemented. Um, question was, it was a different question, right? You said, you, you know there's a list of the people using TPR, but what about the other? No, it doesn't exist. The list doesn't exist. Okay. I don't know it, at least. We know that a lot of people are experimenting with it and trying to build stuff. Okay. So service catalog is one, open shift, of course, and Red Hat is one. I mean, it's uh, triggered by Red Hat uh, and developed in parts. Yeah. So we will see more of those APIs, I was pretty sure. Yeah, I think you came to the a meetup a few times ago. We had Giant Swarm talking about how they're using TPR um, for their Kubeception stuff. Kubeception. And there are many people asking for especially validation, and uh, it will not be in 1.7, I'm pretty sure, maybe in 1.8. So I guess a number of them might also look at external API servers at some moment. So aggregation, you can get the lossless between version data conversion. Yeah. So this this library, um, I can open it here. This is really the core library of Kubernetes itself. So this is the, the basis of the Cube API server, which implements, of course, conversion. And um, there are mechanisms to um, I can show that very briefly. There are mechanisms uh, using code generation to create conversions as far as possible. So I just, let's go to batch here. And um, so you have V1 and V2 alpha 1 here. And if we go into V1, you see something that, that generated conversion. Um, it's not really surprising. It takes an internal object and a V1 object and just convert that and there's all around. It exists for every every version and this can be generated as long as the fields match and it's trivial and you can um, implement your own special functions and the generator will see them, oh this is a special, I have to use a special one and then you can implement your logic. That's how it works. And if you, uh, maybe I can if I go into the sample API server, you will find exactly the same. So, sample API server package. Here is a model, whatever it means. Um, here are the types, so it's go. There's a flunder, pretty trivial, but there's a spec, which is empty, okay, but it's there. And you also have a v1 and you have a conversion, so it's the same thing. Thank you.